Welcome everyone to our epic event of this year. This is one of McGill's premier uh, events, the Trottier Public Science Symposium. <clears throat> and as uh, many of you know, because you've been with us in the past, uh, we normally have a large, vibrant audience in an auditorium cheering wildly. <laughs> Unfortunately, because of the pandemic last year, we had to resort to being online and we have to do the same thing this year. We're hoping to get back to a real audience next year. Uh, we have two presenters today and we'll talk about them in a few minutes. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of uh, both sessions and you can put your questions in, in the chat. <clears throat> All right. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Joe Schwartz. I direct McGill's Office for uh, Science and Society. And uh, we uh, try to make sure that you're up to date on the machinations of science. So let's get going here and introduce you to this year's Chartier Public Science Symposium. We're going to be talking about the science of life and death. At our office at McGill, our mandate is to separate sense from nonsense. And as you can imagine, that is quite a difficult thing to do these days because we're living with an information tsunami. The internet is wonderful, gives us all kinds of information, but unfortunately, trying to get information from it is indeed like trying to drink from a fire hydrant because we have to make sure that we're able to separate the fact from the myth, the sense from the nonsense. And that is exactly what we try to do here with the annual Laurent Chartier Public Science Symposium. <clears throat> Laurent Chartier is a philanthropist and he is uh, a great lover of science and a promoter of science. And he supports this uh, annual symposium for which we are very grateful. He uh, certainly would like to have everyone have a sound education in science. He's been a long time promoter of quality uh, education. And I think Lorne, like myself, would have been extremely happy to meet Sir Humphrey Davy back in the early part of the 1800s because he was a very, very fervent supporter of, of science and uh, one of the greatest scientists indeed of, of all time. And he recognized the importance of scientific education. But the reason I mention Davy to you here tonight is because he basically launched the first real public science lectures. And they were lectures that drew people from all over England, not only from London, to the Royal Institution, where he would perform various experiments to the light of the crowd. This, of course, was before TV, before radio, live entertainment was the only way to go. And his lectures were so popular that they even stimulated cartoons. And here is a classic cartoon where you see the impish Humphrey Davy in the background with uh, bellows filled with laughing gas because he often lectured on this. And you can see the volunteer from the audience has just inhaled the laughing gas, which is making a rather dramatic exit from his rear portals. But it's been said that Humphrey Davy's greatest discovery was Michael Faraday, who many have said, uh, along with Newton, is perhaps the greatest scientist who ever lived because he had his fingers as so many pies. But he is so well known for his wonderful, elegant public lectures on science. <clears throat> These lectures were so popular and drew so many people to the Royal Institution that it became the first street in the British Empire to be made one way because the carriage traffic was so vibrant coming to Faraday's lectures. Now, interestingly enough, Michael Faraday, the prototype of the scientific lecturer, had rather this unusual quote, lectures which really teach will never be popular, lectures which are popular will never really teach. It may be the only thing Faraday was ever wrong about because his lectures were extremely popular and very scientific especially the one about the chemical history of a candle. And he did a whole lecture looking at every aspect of the candle and it's just wonderful. 
you can get the book and read about it. Well, we, of course, try to follow in his footsteps with our public lectures and with the Trottier Public Science Symposium. We've been at this now for 11 years, and our very first one focused on confronting pseudoscience. And we had as our prime speaker at that time, the inimitable <laughs> James Randi. And uh, that was quite a kickoff to our endeavor of publicizing science to the public. Ever since then, we've had uh, annual events. We've tackled all kinds of uh, uh, scientific uh, topics. Oh, we had Dr. Walter Willett from Harvard tell us about nutrition. We had Dr. Patch Adams telling us about the body-mind connection. Uh, John Ioannidis uh, uh, warned us about uh, the lack of uh, evidence in some publications that are out there, even in the so-called peer-reviewed world. And then we had Dr. Ruth Westheimer, who told us, well, you know what she told us, you know what she talks about. And then we had David Sinclair from Harvard telling us how to live longer, increase our lifespan. Well, tonight we're taking a different tack. We are going to examine the science of life and death. And we will even take a look at what may happen after we die. Now, of course, the last two years, we have been living with this virus and our world has been turned upside down. And we are living with the specter of death, unfortunately, because over 4 million people, of course, have already succumbed to this disease. So there's plenty to talk about in terms of COVID, life and death. <laughs> Tonight, we have two speakers. Uh, Carrie Northe is um, a mortician. She will tell us about uh, what it is like to have to deal with bodies after life has left them. But first, we are going to start with Dr. Paul Offit. Paul needs no introduction. He is hot off CNN. He appeared there just about an hour ago. He's a professor of vaccinology, University of Pennsylvania. He's a co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine that children get. He's the author of over a hundred scientific papers. He's written numerous books and you have certainly seen him on CNN. Today, Paul is going to address us about living with COVID. I present Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you very much, John. So you cannot start screen share with the other participant is sharing. So you need to let me yeah. share my screen. I'm unshared. Wait. Share screen. Wait, this looks promising. Go here, here, here. Okay. You see that? Yeah, we're all good. Okay, good. I actually could actually talk about uh, dealing with death as well because I'm a Philadelphia Eagles season ticket holder. <laughs> Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is is what we're all interested in is is what has to happen in order for us to stop this pandemic. I, it depends on two things: um, immunity induced by vaccination and indu immunity induced by natural inf infection, both of which are protective against serious illness. So we'll start with vaccination. As you know, vaccines work. Um, the blue lines represent uh, the the rate of um, uh, hospitalization in various age groups and people who are unvaccinated as compared to those who are fully vaccinated. Um, this vaccine, which was created really in about 11 months from the isolation of the virus, is um, amazing in its ability to protect and protect safely. But it doesn't work if you don't get it. Then there's the immunity induced by um, disease, if you look uh, on uh, places like CNN or MSNBC, they'll, they'll say that there have been 45 million cases in the United States, but those are just people who have been tested and found to be infected. If you do antibody surveillance studies uh, looking for antibodies against the um, SARS-CoV-2 nuclear protein, which is a proof really of natural infection, you find that that number is off by at least a factor of two and probably higher. So um, does natural infection infection protect against disease. This was an early study that was done um, out of the Cleveland Clinic of 52,000 healthcare workers uh, between December 2020 and May 2021. It was about 1,400 workers that were infected but not subsequently vaccinated, and they were found to be protected against disease when exposed um, over that relatively short period of time. 
And this is a study uh, by my, out of Michael Nusenzweig's lab and co-workers showing that at least protection following natural infection induces fairly high levels or high frequencies of memory B cells, which are the immunological component necessary for protection against serious illness. And so it is likely that you're, if naturally infected or frankly, if vaccinated, you're likely protected against serious illness for years. That's the, the prediction. But again, we learn as we go with this virus. And then, of course, there's there's immunity induced by disease plus vaccination. Just, oops, oops, hold it. Um, yeah. So so because these are not two separate groups, the, the um, those who are the, or those who have been vaccinated and naturally infected and vice versa. So in any case, um, to, to achieve herd immunity, which is to say to achieve a, a level where the, it's very difficult from this for this virus to spread from one person to the other. Um, at, at least as of October 15, 2021, about 405 million doses of COVID vaccines had been administered in the United States. About 57 percent of our total population is fully vaccinated. As I said earlier, at least 100 million people are naturally infected. These aren't separate groups. But if you combine the immunity induced by disease with that induced by immunization, at least 80 percent of the U.S. population is probably protected against serious, serious disease. And this is actually an article that just came out in this week's journal, of the American Medical Association, which sort of is consistent with that. It, it did uh, sort of zero prevalence following either natural infection or immunization, uh, looking at, at just millions of um, blood bank specimens from donated blood, and again, found the zero prevalence rate of a, around 80%. So I, I think that that's probably um, close. Okay, so what percentage of the population needs to be immune to induce herd immunity? That depends on two factors. My person does move, moves, wait. Okay. One is the um, the contagiousness index of the, the virus, the so-called R0. Um, uh, the uh, estimated contagiousness index for the Delta variant is, is quite high. It's between five and nine as estimated by the CDC. So by contagiousness index, what I mean is if you have a contagiousness index of five, that means if you're infected and you go about your normal day and everybody you come in contact with is susceptible, you'll infect five people. So that, that's sort of, this is sort of five to nine is in the chickenpox range, which is uh, uh, sort of, certainly a highly transmissible virus. Every time I push it, it comes back. Okay, there we go. So the formula depends on two things. One is the the R naught. The other thing is the um, the protective efficacy of the vaccine. Although really, it's protective efficacy against significant shedding. So the formula is R naught minus one over R naught divided by the effectiveness of the vaccine. So if you assume an R naught of five. So five minus one over five is 0 0.8, 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.9, if that's our uh, percent efficacy, is about 0 0.9. Um, 0 .9. So um, currently it should say here about 80%, but I think we still need to vaccinate about 40 million more people here in the United States if we really want to achieve um, herd immunity. So there are three obstacles to herd immunity. The first is the variants. We've now had um, three significant variants over the last year and a half. Um, the first variant that didn't have a um, a Greek letter designation. The virus that originally raised its its head in Wuhan was really not the virus that left China. The virus that left China was the so-called D614G variant. That's the variant that swept across uh, Asia, across Europe, across the United States, killed about a hundred, couple hundred thousand people here, which was then replaced by the more transmissible alpha variant, which has sin since been replaced by the much more transmissible Delta variant. There's a Delta plus variant, which has raised its head in the United Kingdom, which uh, might be more transmissible, but time will tell. Frankly, it's hard to imagine a, a strain much more contagious than Delta. It's, it's, that is highly contagious for a coronavirus. Uh, this slide just shows how Delta has taken over in the United States. Here it says 94%. Right, right now it's closer to 98%. Okay, obstacle number two, and Joe alluded to this in the introduction, is the misinformation. So here's a New Yorker cartoon. Honey, come look. I found some information all the world's top scientists and doctors missed. This is what we're dealing with. Okay, so let's go through some of the sort of uh, false uh, statements that are out there, of which there are many. I'm just going to select a few. The first, because this is coming up now, I'm on the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee, and um, we are meeting tomorrow to discuss um, vaccines for the 5 to 11-year-old in our uh, country. But you can hear, I, I, I'm not kidding, over the past two days, I have gotten about 1,500 emails from people in what clearly is a targeted campaign against all voting members of the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee telling us to vote no on this 5 to 11-year-old recommendation. And one of the, the key things that they constantly say is that vaccines are necessary for children because children just don't get sick. 
Um, let me go back. I'm going to keep missing slides here. Okay, so there. So um, over the last few weeks, we've seen a real increase in the number of cases in children, um, between 150,000 to 250,000 cases, uh, certainly far greater than when the virus first came into this country. It is true, certainly, that 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 uh, that most of the death is, is in older people. 93% of the deaths in the United States are in people over 55 years of age. But certainly children can be infected. And if you look, sorry, here, it's missing. Um, when the virus first came into the U.S., um, it accounted for fewer than 3% of children, accounted for fewer than 3% of the cases. Now it's almost 27%. So this is a disease of childhood now. And although it is true that children get infected less, inf less frequently, and when they're infected, they're infected less severely, they can be infected severely. And um, right now we're seeing about uh, 2,000 hospitalizations a week in the United States, also um, multi-system inflammatory disease, which now involves, has involved more than 5,000 children, um, and is primarily the disease of the um, 5 to 13-year-old with an average being 9, uh, and uh, so now we have more than 5,000 cases, about 42 deaths in children from this disease. And plus, you know, children suffer, I think, more than any other group from the lack of socialization that comes with being in school. Um, there's been an increase in teen suicide. Um, child abuse, which is, at least in Philadelphia, is an issue and, and is typically picked up in school, hasn't been uh, picked up because, because schools were closed for so long. And in many cases, at least in Philly, um, you know, sometimes it's the only decent meal that kids get during the day. Okay, so the another uh, misconception is that, and this is probably the most frequent question I get asked, uh, COVID-19 vaccines decrease fertility. So um, this, fear, the, this fear was born when two researchers petitioned the European Medicines Agency, which is roughly equivalent to the FDA, to withdraw approval for COVID-19 cl vaccines, claiming that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, the, which is the protein against which you make antibodies when you're vaccinated, shared genetic sequences with syncytion 1, which is a protein on placental cells that's important for placental health. Now, first of all, that's wrong. They don't share genetic sequences. It's like saying you and I have the same social security number because they both contain the number five. So because they don't have shared genetic sequences, they are immunologically distinct. So that was just wrong. Um, when the, the trials were done in pregnant, when the, the phase three trials were done, although pregnant women were, um, were asked not to, to, uh, to be in these trials and also women were asked not to get pregnant during the trials, nonetheless, there were three dozen pregnancies during um, the phase three trials of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines because as Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. So if it was true then that the that uh, vaccines uh, negatively impacted fertility, then there should have been more uh, instances of pregnancy in the placebo group, but that wasn't true. It was equally divided between the two groups, arguing then that the vaccine neither uh, enhanced nor negatively affected your ability to conceive. Also, if you're arguing that antibodies against the spike protein are uh, also directed against syncytion 1, we've just in the United States had more than 100 million people naturally infected making antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So what's happened to the birth rate over the last year, year and a half? And the answer is it stayed about the same. God, I don't know, I can keep skipping. Okay, the next is COVID-19 vaccines alter your DNA. Um, you can see where this comes from. I mean, typically if you're trying to induce an immune response to a viral protein, you give that viral protein in the form of a live attenuated virus like the measles vaccine or a whole killed virus like the polio vaccine or the hepatitis A vaccine or the rabies vaccine. Or you give it as a purified protein, like the hepatitis B vaccine or the human papillomavirus vaccine. But that's not these vaccines. Neither the mRNA vaccines nor the vectored virus vaccines are that. What you, what you do with those vaccines is you give the, the, um, the genetic material, the codes for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So your cells make that protein in much the same manner, actually, as being infected with a live attenuated virus. But you're given a gene. It, this is the... the the sort of large scale use of, for the first time, a genetic um, vaccine. And so, so when people hear the word genetic, they think it's going to alter their DNA. All right, so let, let's use the, the mRNA vaccines as an example. Um, the mRNA vaccines are injected into your arm as a sort of in, in, in that mess, that piece of messenger RNA is encased in the lipid nanoparticle. It's taken up into the cytoplasm of your cell, where that messenger RNA then joins 200,000 other pieces of messenger RNA, which are similarly interested in making proteins and enzymes to help you live. Um, so it, it will do that then for a few days. It'll, it'll enter the ribosomal system and make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and then, d d then disintegrates, and that's it. 
but people worry that it'll get into the nucleus and affect your DNA. Well, first of all, in order to get into the nucleus, it would require a nuclear access signal, which it doesn't have. Um, but even if it did get into the nucleus, it's RNA, it's not DNA. So it would have to be reverse transcribed to DNA using an enzyme like reverse transcriptase, which it also doesn't have. Even if it did get in, which it can't, or it was reverse transcribed, which it doesn't have the enzyme for, it would still have to be integrated into DNA, which requires another enzyme, integrase, which it also doesn't have. So um, the chances of, of this mRNA in any sense altering your DNA is not only small, it's zero. Um, although I always wonder why it is people, when they're worried about having their DNA altered, can't imagine why it would be altered for the better. I mean, why can't you, for example, develop X-ray vision or become Spider-Man? Although, because we never like to stray far from the science here in the Office of Science and, and Society, you become Spider-Man when you're bitten by a radioactive spider. Okay, next is that vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, shouldn't be given during pregnancy. So this is interesting the way this played out. Typically, when, when phase three trials are done for a vaccine, and they, they don't include pregnant women, and these trials should have included pregnant women, because as you'll see in the next slide, pregnant women are at high risk of being seriously infected with this virus. But in any case, the companies didn't include pregnant women. And when that's true, the CDC typically will say that the vaccine is contraindicated in pregnant women because there are no data. But they didn't do that here. Here, what the CDC said was a pregnant woman could reasonably choose to get this vaccine. And the reason they said that is here, that compared with women of the same age who are not pregnant, pregnant women are three times more likely to require ICU care, two to three times more likely uh, to, re to, uh, to require intubation, mechanical ventilation, or ECMO support, and one and a half times more likely to die. So what ended up happening then is thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of pregnant women ultimately did choose to get that vaccine, which enabled researchers like Tim Shimabukuro at the CDC to look at pregnant women who received the vaccine and compare them to pregnant women who didn't receive the vaccine to answer the question, were there any differences in outcomes? Oops, sorry. Um, let's go back. Okay, so what they found was there were no differences in pregnancy outcome, like miscarriage or stillbirth, no difference in terms of pregnancy complications, like gestational diabetes or eclampsia or intrauterine growth restriction. There were no problems for the, the neonates in, in terms of preterm both birth or congenital abnormalities or a small for gestational age or neonatal death. And so with that, the CDC then changed their recommendation to the vaccine was recommended for pregnant women. In the past week and a half, the recommendation changed again, as we've had many pregnant women who have gotten hospitalized and either have succumbed to this infection or delivered their babies severely prematurely. So they have now have an urgent uh, 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 recommendation out there for pregnant women to get this vaccine. Okay, the next is that um, COVID-19 vaccines cause people to be magnetic. So here's, here's uh, an anti-vaccine activist named Sherry Tenpenny, who's sort of a veteran anti-vaccine activist, testifying in front of the Ohio lawmakers claiming that COVID-19 vaccines make people magnetic. Honestly, I, I think some of these anti-vaccine folks just sit in the room and bet on what they can get people to believe. But they've gotten people to believe even this, as you can see a woman who testified at that hearing showing that she has in fact become magnetic. So let's take a closer look. MRA vaccines contain lipids, potassium chloride, monobasic potassium phosphate, sodium chloride, dibasic sodium phosphate, dihydrate, and sucrose, none of which are paramagnetic. Professor Michael Cooey from the School of Physics at Trinity College Dublin has stated, quote, you would need about one gram of iron metal to attract and support a permanent magnet at the injection site, something you would easily feel if it was there. And our own Joe Schwartz has weighed in on this, as you'll see even in the next slide, Quote, our liver, which is loaded with iron, isn't ripped out of our body when we get a magnetic resonance imaging scan, is it? And people who get iron injections or take iron supplements, which do contain ferrous or ferric ions that are paramagnetic, do not become magnetized. And there's Joe showing that, you know, you actually can get things that are metal to stick to you for reasons having nothing to do with being magnetic. 
Okay, then this, um, according to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, the COVID-19 vaccines kill people. The Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which was created under the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act in, in uh, 1986, is basically a passive system where anybody who feels that there may have been a, a negative consequence to a vaccine can just fill out a one-page uh, report online and send it in, and there is no screening. You can say that your child got a vaccine and became the incredible Hulk, and that will be in this data set. There is no screening for this. So um, not surprising, it's a very noisy system. At the, the nicest thing you could say about VAERS is it is a hypothesis generating system, but it is certainly not a hypothesis testing system. Anybody can report anything. So there's Tucker Carlson on Fox News in May of 2021 saying, quote, 3,362 people apparently died after getting the COVID-19 vaccine. More people, according to Veris, have died after getting the COVID-19 shot than from all the other vaccines. He puts absolute trust in those Veris reports. So let's take a closer look. Um, there are about 750 deaths in the United States per 100,000 per year. Therefore, two people die per 100,000 per day. By May 6, 2021, when Tucker Carlson made his dramatic proclamation, 110 million people in the United States had been vaccinated. Therefore, 2,200 people would have been expected to die within 24 hours, 4,400 within 48 hours, unless the vaccines conferred immortality, which they don't. This is the weakness of vaccines. Vaccines are designed to prevent vaccine-preventable diseases only. They don't prevent everything else that happens in life. The 3,300 deaths claimed by Carlson to have been caused by vaccines were exactly what one would have expected, assuming that the vaccines killed nobody. This came up actually when Hank Aaron, a baseball player, died with about two weeks after receiving a vaccine. He's a man in his mid-80s who had um, a stroke, because that's what happens sometimes when you're in your mid-80s. And people, there were a number of news reports claiming that he had died from the vaccine. Okay, this is my favorite one, actually, and it's came up in the news recently. Vaccinated teachers are dangerous to students. So this is a um, a school in the uh, in Florida called the Sentner Academy, which is the ironically named the Brain School. So the headmaster of that school prohibited uh, teachers from coming into the school after they had been vaccinated for a month. They had to wait for a month because her or her notion was that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is toxic, that if you're getting the vaccine, then you're making that protein and then excreting it from your body and then causing others to also suffer the toxic effects of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. I mean, it's just mRNA in cytoplasm making a protein like the 200,000 other pieces of mRNA in your cytoplasm making proteins. I mean, I wish this were true, because if this were true, what that would mean then, if you were an insulin-dependent diabetic, you wouldn't have to get shots. You could just stand next to somebody who was making insulin. Or if you had sickle cell disease, you know, you wouldn't have to be hospitalized, you know, five times a year for these vaso-occlusive, painful vaso-occlusive crises and get transfused. You could just stand next to somebody who's making normal hemoglobin. Recently, this uh, school is it's now also prohibiting vaccinated students from coming in until they have they too have to wait a month afterwards. The misinformation potpourri was, um, I started to me, uh, at least uh, in a 26 minute slickly made video that came out on May the 4th, 2020 called Plandemic. Um, the producer was a guy named Mickey Willis, and there was a, a sort of a um, disreputable scientist named Judy Mikovits, who was the source of all information here. But what was claimed here, mostly by Judy Mikovits, was that hydroxychloroquine cures COVID-19. Not true. That SARS-CoV-2 was manipulated to create a pandemic strain. And I think I think the, the draw of this kind of, of piece is a pandemic is chaos. I mean, whether the vaccines causing autism is chaos. You don't know the cause. You don't know the cure. Here, you know, there's so much that's unknown when this first started. What this does is it creates order out of chaos. Us. It gives you a villain. Here it is. There, there are people manipulating this. You know, it's created in Wuhan. Um, it was released. You know, it's Bill Gates is behind it. I, that that gives you at least a sense of order, even though obviously it's completely wrong. That the influenza vaccine increases the chance of getting COVID-19. That influenza vaccine contains SARS-CoV-2. Oops. That microbes in the ocean cure COVID-19. That wearing a protective mask activates SARS-CoV-2. In fact, there was a a uh, legislator um, named Louis Gohmert in Texas who blamed his SARS-CoV-2 infection on having worn a mask, that Bill Gates created SARS-CoV-2 so that he could make money selling vaccines to prevent it, presuming that $60 billion isn't enough for him, and that COVID-19 death statistics have been manipulated to control the public. 
So as, see if I can get this next one, oops. Okay, that as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, you can't use logic and reason to convince someone out of an argument that they didn't use logic and reason to get into. Okay, so obstacle number three is, and this is particularly upsetting, claims to personal freedom. So, so th this is, this is um, you know, the, the, the kind of argument you hear, you know, this is my body, my choice, personal freedom, civil liberty. Um, this is America. We were founded on the base of individual rights and freedoms and somehow consider um, the, the ability to catch and transmit potentially fatal infections to others as, a, as somehow being a right. Um, you know, if you, if you step on a rusty nail and you, you get, uh, and you, you choose not to get a tetanus vaccine, if, that's fine. You're making a personal choice to get tetanus. If you get tetanus, no one's going to catch tetanus from you. It's not a contagious disease. This is, and it's not your right to transmit it to other people. Um, this is nothing new that here's a, uh, a board sort of a billboard that came out in 19 in 1885, again, making that claim for personal liberty in this case for the smallpox vaccine. So what does personal liberty look like? So this was uh, Springfield, Oregon, um, had a long-term care outbreak that infected 64 people, killed five. That began with one unvaccinated employee who chose not to be vaccinated. Or this report in Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report um, in Marin County, California, of a teacher who was occasionally unmasked, that she was infected with the Delta variant. Uh, she stayed in, the, in front of that classroom for two days, and you can see the she infected 12 of the 24 kids in that classroom, once again, making the case why you should never sit in the front row, or even arguably here the front two rows of a classroom. Oops. So I will stop there, and thank you for your attention. Let me just go. That's there. That is the... URL at Children's Hospital Philadelphia's Vaccine Education Center. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Paul. Before before we go on, just uh, I'd like to ask one question because I'm sure that this will come up, and I want to get this about the booster, the third vaccine. What uh, what is the story? Okay, so the question is, what's the goal of a vaccine? I think a reasonable goal for the vaccine is that the, the goal, frankly, for all vaccines, protect against serious illness, protect against the kind of illness that causes you to seek medical attention, go to the hospital, go to the ICU. These vaccines do that. All the evidence to date in the United States is that all three vaccines have done that up to the present time through the Delta variant and including all age groups. What happens is over time, this is true also for all vaccines, is neutralizing and, and, and the reason that's true, the reason that holds up is because it's mediated by immunological memory and memory cells are, are, are fairly long lived. Um, however, over time, neutralizing antibodies will fade. That's true of all vaccines. And with that, you'll have a fading of immunity against mild or asymptomatic infection. Typically, who cares? Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, as Lindsey Graham said, because I think we should, we should look to our Republicans when we're trying to get good quotes on science. As Lindsey Graham said, after he was fully vaccinated and then had an upper respiratory tract infection and sinusitis, he said, and I quote, this would have been much worse if I hadn't been vaccinated. Right. See, Lindsey Graham got it right. Um, but, you know, it's just taken on a life of its own. I think when President Biden stood up at the podium on August 18th and said, we are going to have a vaccine starting on September 20th as a booster dose for everyone over 16 years of age, the train left the station. And it's been really hard to get it back. Um, we, we try and create these subgroups. Here's my advice. If you're over 70 years of age, there are clear data that a booster dose decreases your incidence of serious disease by from 12% if exposed, if infected, to like 4%. That's, those data are clear. There are no other data showing that booster dosing makes a difference. Now, the recommendation, which everybody seemed to agree on, that if you're over 50 and you have a medical condition that puts you at, at higher risk of severe disease, that you should get a booster. There are no data to show that that really matters. I can tell you that, that at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, when adults get admitted to our to, to that hospital where children over 12 get admitted to our hospital, it's not because they haven't had a third dose. It's because they haven't had any doses. And, and that's the issue. I, I really don't think it's going to change the arc of the pandemic much. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to tell that since, the, in, in, at least in the U.S., the rates of infection and, and uh, hospitalization are starting to come down already. Um, but it's it sort of Israel drove this. And, and when what Israel, when they, because I'm on the vaccine advisory committee, and, and Israel presented bo at both of our meetings when we were talking about boosters, and they're showing these data, and the only good data they have are for those over 70. And then they, then they also show, look, if we give the vaccine to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds, that you're starting to see the instance of the disease coming down. Well, we're starting to see it come down too. I, I mean, it has nothing to do with boosters. And, and remember, over time, what we always do is we compare vaccinated people to 
unvaccinated people. That's not the right comparison. The right comparison is unvaccinated people to unprotected people, meaning people who haven't been naturally infected either. Because over time, as more natural infection occurs, your vaccine efficacy isn't going to look as good. And I think at some level, that's what was happening in, in uh, Israel. So I don't know. I'm disappointed by the way the whole booster story has played. I don't know if anybody read the New York Times today, but there was a long, or a long article talking about how not just me, but a lot of other people in the advisory committees, both for the CDC and FDA, were sort of disappointed the way this has played out. So I don't know if that helps you, but that's well, tomorrow story. when you get to vote on whether to give uh, the vaccine to the kids, how does that work? Is, is it an actual vote? And it's a, yes. majority, it's a majority opinion? Yes, and it's a majority opinion. I mean, it can if it's one vote one way or the other. But remember, we're an advisory committee, so we give advice. And so the FDA then can choose or to or not to follow our advice. And how many people on this advisory committee? Uh, it, it depends. Usually 18 or 19 voters. So it could be a close vote. We'll see. <laughs> OK, thanks very much. Let me just add one more thing about the freedom of, uh, you know, individual rights and all of this. That drives, drives us crazy dealing with that. And you don't have the right to take a, a gun on an airplane. You don't have the right to drive the wrong way on a one-way street. You don't have the right to drive at 100 miles per hour in a school zone, although some people do, right? We accept that there are laws that protect us as a society. Why should we not accept that there is proper scientific opinion that the vaccines protect the population? Anyway, that it drives us crazy. All right, thanks a lot. So we're going to switch now from living with COVID to what happens if we don't make it. We've asked uh, Carrie Northey to join us today, and uh, she has had a long career in the mortuary uh, business. Uh, she knows all about embalming. She knows all about what happens to dead bodies. Uh, do they sometimes move around? What happens if they, someone has died and they have uh, uh, perhaps a pacemaker inside and they want to be cremated? Is there any problem with that? And what about occupational hazards? So we're going to get a different look at, uh, at science from the point of view of a mortician. And this is something that, that we rarely get. Uh, so, uh, Carrie has been uh, in the business for well over 20 years. Uh, she teaches students. She has tours. Uh, she knows all about both the business side and the science side of, uh, uh, of being a mortician. So, we're going to ask her to tell us what it is like to be involved in this profession. Carrie, take it away. There, thank you. Well, hello everybody and welcome. We're going to talk about embalming and the curious dead. Um, I do show some photos of some deceased in this presentation. They're from unknown places of origin, um, but they may be sensitive. So just kind of a forewarning. So, but welcome. Um, I've been in the business. I've been licensed 19 years, been an embalmer in Michigan and a funeral director in Michigan and worked in the business over 27 years. I wear a lot of hats. That's the beauty of my job. I get to be a therapist, an event planner, an accountant, a chemist, an anatomist. And some days I get to drive a hearse with a whirly light on top and go through red lights. So every day is quite an adventure for me. And that's one of the reasons I love this business. But today we're going to dive into the preparation side of what I do a little bit. Um, answering some questions that people have, going through the history of embalming and preparation through my YouTube journey and being Carrie the Mortician on YouTube. I found that keyboard warriors often ask some of the juicier questions. So I'm going to hit on a few of those topics, cover my three most asked questions towards the end of this, and then open it up to you for question and answer as well. So to start, what is embalming? Um, it is the temporary preservation of a deceased through internal and external applications with the intent to delay decomposition. The super boring, quote unquote, 
description of embalming there. Um, we're decomposing the moment that our hearts stop. Sometimes now we're even seeing decomposition beginning before the person dies because of medications and medical treatments to keep the body alive while parts of us are dying. So we're seeing decomposition start before actual death even. But embalming is more than just injecting formaldehyde, draining out blood. It's preserving in various ways to allow viewing, to allow funerals, to allow that gathering of family. Now, there's three overall goals that we have when we're embalming. Sanitization, presentation, and preservation. And we've found in the last year or two, especially Sanitizing has been a big one around the funeral home. Now, many attempts have been made over the centuries to preserve the dead. It's a very, very old tradition. The oldest tradition within the business is flowers for burials, but embalming is right up there. Now, honey, zinc chloride, alcohol baths are some of the things that have been used over the years, many, many years, to try to preserve a body when they have died. Now, the modern method of embalming involves the injection of various chemical solutions into the arterial network of the body to primarily disinfect, disinfect and slow the decomposition. So you can see intestinal bacteria is eaten away, embalming fluids coming in to stop it and blow past it. So um, these are by the mortician memes on Instagram has a lot of good funeral related humor memes. So the Egyptians got the whole thing started back in the day. So their attempts at preservation, as we see when mummies are in earth worked, mummies are very well preserved for being deceased people. Um, they used natron back in the day, which is a naturally occurring mixture of a kind of soda ash and baking soda. And they used it with small quantities of sodium chloride, sodium sulfate. And it's this powder and this texture that they would rub over the bodies to dry them out. It was taken from these dry lake beds in ancient Egypt. And it's been used for thousands of years for preservation, but also things that people put on their body for cleaning around homes. It's got quite an extensive past, this natron. Now, also deceased were found in all these unearthings over the years by archaeologists. Spain was a location for finding the oldest artificially preserved bodies, and they used cinnabar back in the day. Um, which is a bright red form of a mercury sulfide. It's commonly used, um, or it's a commonly sourced or refined elemental mercury. And it was used for like painting when they use vermilion. If you hear vermilion, that is what they were using. Now it's found in massive granular forms, as you can see. It's very dangerous though, because you're exposing to mercury. Now, Italians also, the one photo on the screen was one, uh, was a deceased found in Italy that they had unearthed. And that was using mercury, like solely mercury on the person. Now, the problem with a lot of methods used to preserve the deceased over the centuries is that they're dangerous. We find that even now today with formaldehyde and glutaraldehydes, but over the years, it was even more so dangerous back in the day. So William Harvey was a 17th century English physicist or physician, sorry, that injected color solutions into corpses to learn how the circulatory system worked. They figured out, okay, there's this highway of things inside of a body, but how does that even work? So he got the ball rolling with how to figure this out which then allowed us to figure out how to preserve from the inside out rather than just wrapping a body and packing around a body. So the Scottish, Scottish surgeon, William Hunter was the first to apply this knowledge to embalming techniques. He wrote a report called the appropriate methods for embalming in order to preserve bodies for burial. 
catchy title, right? Well, his brother, John Hunter, took those things and started advertising himself as a body preservation specialist, an embalmer, essentially. And the demand for that grew and grew into the 19th century. And this was found for sentimental reasons. People thought, huh, I can keep my loved one around a little bit longer. Why not do it? And so they started requesting these things more and more and more. People also wanted to go to far off places, be buried in the far off locations or be brought back from far off locations. And with railways, people were able to mourn and they were able to bring those people back home. So other motives behind embalming were prevention of disease and then also wanting to have those funerals and burials. So you can see on your screen a little bit about the denaturization. So you've got normal proteins and then they denaturize during the biological breakdown after death. But as you can see in the meme again, embalming fluid comes in and stops that denaturization of those proteins, which is what we need to do to preserve the body, even temporarily. So when the practice of embalming became more prominent in the United States was during the American Civil War. All the servicemen were going across the countries to fight and then they would die. But families wanted their loved ones back as we all would want. And so they had to find a way to extend that time period in their favor. Because at that time, once they were identified on the field, packed up, shipped home, they were unrecognizable because of decomposition. The period around 1861 is known as the funeral period of embalming. Now, this is when anatomical donation embalming became separate from embalming for funeral purposes. So Dr. Thomas Holmes, who's shown in the picture, received a commission from the Army Medical Corps to embalm the dead Union officers to return to their families. He reportedly embalmed over 4,000 soldiers and officers. That's a lot. Military authorities also permitted private embalmers to work in military controlled areas. So I see these pictures every time and I look back and I think, whoa, because he's on a board out gosh knows where, who knows what kind of fighting is going around. And he has a little hand pump embalming thing that he's just injecting fluids into these bodies. And I think, did you guys ever watch that show Voyagers back in the day where they flipped through time with their little Omni thing and they'd go to different points in history. This is like a embalming point in history that I would love to jump back to and go just see how they embalmed out in the battlefield with a little hand pump, these people then stick them in, in the second photo, as you can see the coffins and send them back home quite a thing to see, to be able to do that. So the death of Abraham Lincoln was a huge point in embalming history as well, which most people don't really think about, but he was the first kind of notable figure who was shipped across the country on his train and then through in his horse-drawn hearse and was perfectly preserved during that whole time period. It hadn't really been heard of up until that point for that to happen. So it was a pretty big deal. Now, looking at the chemicals, the arsenic debate was a huge thing because back in the day, that's what they were using. They were using arsenic based fluid chemicals that they had come up with. So until the early 20th century, embalming fluids often contained arsenic. There was concern about the possibility of arsenic from embalming embalmed bodies contaminating the groundwater supply and legal concerns that people who had been accused of murdering someone with arsenic poisoning, that they couldn't prove it if they were embalming with arsenic. Historically, as we've said, the chemicals that will work the best are often some of the worst for us and the trickle effect of groundwater or, you know, contamination. So in 1867, the German chemist 
August Wilhelm von Hoffmann discovered formaldehyde, which is the chemical that we now use most frequently when we are embalming. Its preservative properties were noted very quickly and it became the foundation for modern methods of embalming. So typically embalming fluid contains a mixture of formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, methanol, humectants, wetting agents, and all sorts of other things. We try and stay within certain percentages. Some embalmers really key in on using chemical equations to figure out the percentage of how much formaldehyde they need based on the condition of the deceased. So a lot of the negative feedback about the business of embalming and funeral directing is from the fact that we use these chemicals. And people are often worried about the local treatment plants and what happens to our water source and such. So uh, my friend Ben Schmidt, who is a professor and an embalmer, um, he teaches embalming at a mortuary school. And we've done a few videos called Embalming Chemicals in the Wild. Well, he's done a bunch of them and he did one with me um, that's shown above for my YouTube channel. And we kind of he, he has been really wanting to defunk that whole thing that we are surrounded by embalming chemicals every day. So embalming someone and placing them in the ground is not as scary as everyone tries to make it out to be because we are choosing things to bring in our home like air fresheners and furniture that gives us far more exposure to embalming chemicals. So those things have created some really great conversation. So embalming as we know it today is used to create a more lifelike appearance, but it's more a temporary preservation. Sometimes we find there is extra long preservation, but it's a temporary method that we have used. So talking a little about how embalming happens, the basics of embalming. So we start in a preparation room. It's gonna have a table, um, sometimes made of porcelain, stainless steel, gonna be an embalming machine that's going to pressurize, inject fluid into the deceased. We're gonna have a sink, water sources, uh, air filtration. We're then also gonna use PPE, personal protective equipment. It's very, very important in our industry and even more so over the last two years. We use respirators, gowns, gloves, goggles. We also during peak of you know, COVID had a very hard time and we're using garbage bags and everything we could and we're using masks and such. So same kind of things were happening in the funeral business um, even though it wasn't called frontline. Now instruments we use are somewhat like surgical and medical field things, we have aneurysm hooks that um, the top at the top where we use those to dissect tissue and raise up arteries and vessels. We use suture needles, um, either S curve, C curve. We use tissue spreaders. Um, and then the bottom long pointed is called the trocar. And I'm going to get to that one a little more here in a minute. We also use scalpels. Now, traditional embalming has very specific steps. The first is setting of the features. We close the eyes. We will use what's called an eye cap. That's shown there. It's kind of like a contact lens with little points on it. That just helps hold the lid of the eye closed. We're then going to close the mouth. We do suture or with wire tie the mouth closed. Um, we either use a suture needle and suture thread, or some people use a needle injector, which drives a little bracket into the gum and there's wires. And that is used to tie together to hold the jaw closed. Our natural form when we die is mouth open and eyes open. It takes muscle control to close eyes and to close the mouth. So we have to not force, but put those parts of our face into that position. We then have to raise vessels and inject the fluid. So most embalmers will choose the carotid artery, which is up in the neck area, where we inject and drain out the jugular vein. However, some prefer the femoral artery, some the axillary, radial, subclavian. It just depends on distribution and preference. Sometimes we have to raise multiple vessels. 
So we may say, oh, we had a four point or a six point or a seven point today, depending how many vessels we had to raise. One big thing here, and everyone seems shocked, everything that comes out of that body goes down the drain, your regular old drain that you use at home to the regular water source and goes through the water treatment plant. Now, the next step after injecting is going to be the cavity work. And this part I never even knew happened until I watched my first embalming. So we use that trocar. It's about two feet long. It's got a point on it. It's hollow and it's hooked up to a tube in a machine that creates a suction that's placed into the abdomen, punctured in. And our, the point is we want to puncture as much internal as possible and suck out as much fluid and stuff from the abdomen that's causing the bacteria to build up that's decomposing the body quickly, we want to get that out so we can put preservative fluids back in. Sometimes we have to topically treat the deceased. Either the circulatory system is kaput or there's maybe sores, ulcers, um, infected areas that we have to treat from the outside. And we will use topical embalming um, gel. And then we also want to make sure we moisturize the skin so that the person does not dehydrate. So we use different massage creams, stone oils to do that. So the types of embalming would be the arterial injection. Hypodermically, we may need to inject with a hypodermic fluid in different pockets around the body. If there's not distribution, the cavity fluid into the cavity with that trocar and then topicals. So I would love to show you way more photos of restoration. That's something everyone's super interested in. You know, if someone is in an accident or if someone is, um, got a lot of damage from their death, what do we do? Because we do magic. It feels like some days. So we're, we're kind of magicians. I should say in what we do. But imagine some worst case scenarios, maybe a shotgun blast to the head, crushing death by large machinery, um, massive tumors that eat away jaws and parts of the facial tissue. And this seems like maybe it's non-viewable situations. However, with the right skill and training, a lot of those deceased can be made viewable. Advanced restoration can take dozens of hours and use of mediums like plaster of Paris, wax, and many other embalmers have come to love other items as well. But with resection of the face, rebuilding of the bone structure, laying back over of the tissue we do have, you can build up at least a version of the person that's recognizable. We use waxes and then we go into cosmetics. So do, do you guys recognize this from the movie, my girl, it was kind of that funny moment where they took the school marm and they made her up all fancy, it wasn't quite right. So surprisingly, many embalmers use everyday cosmetics like Mary Kay and Revlon. Others use mortuary company cosmetics. Um, and sometimes they favor an airbrush technique, which allows a hands-free application once wax is placed, if we have to use wax, it's actually better not to touch the deceased because it sticks and pulls away. So that's why a lot of people do like the airbrush. If hair is missing, we can use wigs or hair extensions to cut lengths of hair to place on the deceased to recreate that hair that might be missing. We can also take hair from the back of the deceased that's not going to show because it's down in the pillow and move that hair into place of where, what might be missing using glue and waxes. So you see what we want you to see, essentially. It's really an illusion of the person that we're creating for the loved ones to view and connect with for that final moment. And even if the person's not perfect, they may be perfectly recognizable. So restoration is possible in most or many cases, honestly, it just takes the right time, right skill, the right confidence sometimes to do that. So curious minds want to know. Now I get asked a lot of questions 
and many in repetition. And I mean, hundreds of times because curious minds want to know, and they're very common questions. And I get questions that people have carried with them for decades. And they will say, when I was a kid, you know, and these are 70 year olds asking when I was a child, I went to a funeral and I saw this, why, what happened? And they just want answers. So sometimes they never had anybody to ask until me. So I get a lot of questions a lot. So I've compiled the three most common questions that I get asked as a mortician through my social media. So the first is, do you have to be embalmed? Especially do you have to be embalmed before being cremated? The short answer is no. So each state has their own law as to time frames with the body. However, no state has a law that you have to be embalmed. It is not a law anywhere. Some states do have laws though that within a certain time period, let's say within 48 hours, you do have to be either cremated, buried, kept in cold storage at a certain temperature or embalmed. So there are some caveats to that. You might have to be depending on the scenario. But at the end of the day, know your laws, know your state laws, know your requirements. Every state is different. However, a funeral home may require that you are embalmed for public viewing. And this is their right to rec require that that happen. So if you don't like that answer, you can go to a different funeral home, but you may get the same thing at that funeral home because most funeral homes are going to require for a public viewing that you do have embalming. It's not just to get more money out of you, but it allows us to control the presentation of the deceased. Um, so that way it doesn't reflect badly on the funeral home. If you have a four day old dead person laying out that's discolored and there's no explanation for it for everybody that's visiting. So the next major question I get asked is what does grandma look like that was buried 10, five, eight years ago? I need to know what she looks like. Can you tell me? There's too many variables. You could bury two grandmas, exact same age, weight, race, religion, whatever you want to do, and embalm them exactly the same way. And they're going to both decompose differently. You have so many variables, like whether they were embalmed or not, the water table levels where they're buried, what kind of casket they were in, what kind of vault they're in, if they were taking medications when they die, because those might have affected the embalming, where they died, which could have affected how long they were dead before they were found, their cause of death, part of the country. If they're buried in a place that's very dry, that's the same temperature all year long versus somewhere that has high humidity that fluctuates between winter to summer, you're going to get differences there too. So it's one question people ask a lot because I think they want peace of mind that grandma looks like grandma did, or they want to know that grandma is through the process to the bone stage, whatever it is they want to know, they want to know that, but there's no way to give that answer. So then that last interest peak question that people do ask is, do bodies sit up? Do they make noise or do they wake up? I think some of this is based on fear because people don't want to be any of those when they die, they don't want to accidentally be sent to the funeral home before it's their time. They don't want to maybe go to a funeral and have somebody sit up because everybody knows that somebody that saw somebody sit up. So is it possible for somebody to sit up? No, <laughs> not even a little bit. That body would be working against gravity which is not going to happen to sit up. The most that you're going to hear probably is like a finger twitch, maybe see a muscle twitch. That's going to be in the very early stages after the death. This isn't like two days later, the person's like waving at you. It just doesn't happen. That second question do bodies make noise? Yes, they do. It's not very, very common, but if you have a deceased who has air still in them, their lungs, 
and you move them, you roll them and that air is forced out. They may make a, they may make a uh, noise may come out of them. Still scares the, the crap out of me every time it happens. Cause you don't expect it to happen, but it can happen just like sometimes maybe with gravity, if the arms are up on the person, an arm might slide off when they're on like the preparation table. If you're in there alone working and you turn your back, all of a sudden a hand hits you still going to scare you <laughs> because you don't expect it. These things do happen. It's not the person moving. It's not them physically emitting noise on their own. It's just part of the process. And then that third are, can you wake up at the funeral home? Well, sometimes I'm not going to say no, because it can happen just in Michigan last year, they had somebody at a funeral home, wake up, um, that would have been pronounced dead. She wasn't dead. She woke up at the funeral home. This really is not something that happens very common, but people do have a huge fear of this. They're going to wake up during the embalming. They're going to wake up in the crematorium in the retort. It's based out of fear, but these aren't things that really happen very often. Lots of stories I could dive into, but I want to stay within my time frame and let you guys ask during the Q&A more questions. Um, you know, in conclusion, the face of this business is changing every day. There's now more women going into the field than there are men. Um, there's now funeral homes that look drastically different than they used to years ago. And there's now disposition choices that were never around before. You now have cremation that's water-based, which a lot of people argue it's not cremation, but it's still technically that's kind of the term that generally people are calling it as water cremation. You have composting, you've got green burial, you've got all these other options. So the face of the business is constantly changing with the times, which is beautiful to see. So thank you guys for listening and for going through all this with me. You can check out lots of answers, lots of questions over at um, Carrie the Mortician on YouTube and my email and stuff. Well, thanks, Carrie, very much. I mean, this is uh, kind of information we don't normally get. No, uh, and I blew through a lot of information there, I feel like, too. So most, most of us uh, don't know very much uh, about this. And but it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the science that is involved but i'm particularly intrigued by your last story there of the person waking up yeah what 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 are the details of that story oh goodness i'll have to look back in depthly i have a whole video on it but um there was a girl she's a handicapped girl she'd been handicapped her whole life and um so because she had had so many health concerns going through life when they found that they believed she was dead and the paramedics came and they pronounced her dead. Her heart rate had dropped low enough. They couldn't, they weren't registering anything. So there was not an autopsy necessary because she had had such a history of health conditions, which is very common. So she went from the home to the funeral home. The funeral home came, brought her to the funeral home. And when they got her on the table, they realized that she was breathing a little bit and that there was still life there. And so then they called the, the ambulance and took her to the hospital. She did die a short time later, like a few weeks later, um, she did die, but that was kind of the premise behind it. When you do hear news stories about this happening, it's typically, um, kind of third world country where there's not good medical care, not people who know how to pronounce, not that they don't know how to pronounce stuff, but that they're maybe don't need somebody to come in to um, formally pronounce, they bury very quickly, things of that nature. So it's not happening in America, really. Yeah, very interesting. Because yeah. at one time in the late 1800s, there was a real concern about being buried alive. Uh, there was, story. they hooked bells up. And, yeah. yeah, they hooked bells to the graves and put yeah. ropes down in and because everybody feared it because it did happen once in a while. Interesting. All right, let's see uh, what uh, uh, questions uh, we, uh, we have. Okay, Carrie, um, what is the most environmentally friendly way to deal with a body after death? Um, well, there's a couple ways. So burial and cremation, a typical burial and cremation both use up the same resources. 
So cremation is no more environmentally friendly than burial, truly. Um, water cremation that I've talked about where the person is broken down in a water solution that has a lye type a lye based substance in it. The after product is completely sanitary. It's kind of what's used at Mayo Clinic to dispose of um, samples and things just on a larger scale. So that off product can be used to fertilize forests, which it is in some areas. And then the family has back their cremated remains. The only real resource you've used is some electricity. So that is a very environmentally your friendly option. Green burial is as well. You're still using up land space, but you can do a burial with things that are friendly that go back into the earth. So the body is not embalmed. You can use a shroud that breaks down. It's, it's not contaminating as some people say, like a ground burial with a casket and embalming and such would be. So uh, is there ever a reason to freeze bodies or does that ever happen? There are cryogenic places around. There's one in Michigan, and I'd like to go visit them and learn more about the why behind it. There's not really a reason, though, no, that I, I, that I know of. Um, I mean, people that use cryogenics obviously have a reason for what they do, but I'm, I need to dive more into that because it's a kind of a foreign thing to the majority, I think. I think in theory, you could freeze someone in liquid nitrogen and grind them up into a powder. There is a technique that is, um, I think, theorized right now that they freeze them and then shake them or, or something and it breaks them down. Um, there's composting now too, where you get composted down into a product that you can then use in your yard or wherever. So there's, there's a lot of new techniques coming out, but our industry takes a really long time to get anything legalized. Does every mortician have to be a makeup artist and hairdresser as well as a mortician? I, they do not have to be. So you can work in different areas of the funeral home. You don't, you can just meet with families. You can just work on bodies. You can hire in true cosmetologists and hairdressers. If you work in a small town, you are it. You are all the, you're wearing every hat and you're going to get better at every area of it. So you do have to do all the parts. Okay. I'm not sure we have Paul back because uh, I'm not seeing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Paul, <clears throat> question for you. Are you seeing normal amounts of non-COVID illnesses in pediatric patients like chicken pox, influenza, rotavirus? Well, so, so um, rotavirus, we see very little of. I mean, since the vaccine came out in 2006 and then the second vaccine came out in 2008, no, we see, we see very little rotavirus. I think probably most pediatric residents have not seen a case of rotavirus, at least not in the hospital. So, no. Flu, flu will be interesting. I mean, we're, we're seeing flu. Um, and um, because we didn't have flu last year, because we masked and social distances and closed businesses and closed schools, um, the question is, what would flu look like this year? We'll see. We are seeing flu. We're seeing respiratory syncytial virus. We're seeing human coronaviruses. So we're starting to see the winter respiratory viruses. Um, and we'll see how the year plays out. Can you comment on the claims of graphene in COVID-19 vaccines? Yeah, doesn't exist. Right. That's one of these bogus things that goes around. Uh, absolute total nonsense. Now, here's an interesting question. Actually, this is for both of you. <laughs> what is the clinical sign that someone is dead? How is death defined? Because I know this, this has been quite a controversy and there have been committees struck in order to define the time of death. Is it when the heart stops? Is it when there's no more brain waves? You want to answer, Paul? No, this is for you. <laughs> oh, um, I, don't, I don't know. I'm going to just throw out a couple thoughts on this. So when it comes to like organ and tissue donation, there's, there's different types of death, um, where your body is completely done, where you're termed dead, but yet your body's being still kept in motion for donation. So there's kind of different variations on death, I guess you could say, but I think it's when your heart stops is just that. <clears throat> 
Yeah, I, I can comment a bit on this because I've been really lo looking into this because uh, there has been a lot of controversy about this um, due to the uh, uh, something that I will talk a little bit about tomorrow is the head transplant, which is, is oh. more real than people think. And so the question comes up about, are you dead when there are no brain waves at all and the heart is still beating? Uh, can you be dead when the heart has stopped? Is that enough of a definition? And actually in the 1960s, a Harvard committee was struck in order to come up with an answer uh, for, the, for this. Wow. And uh, uh, this, this was you know, at the height of the controversies about heart transplants. Uh, when, you know, the question was, <laughs> were doctors uh, ripping hearts out of people so that they can transplant them into, into others? And anyway, I, I, I know that the conclusion that that committee came to is, is that uh, death is when there is no, uh, no semblance of any kind of uh, brain activity. Mm -hmm. But Paul, have you ever had a, any situation where you thought someone was dead and they came back? Well, again, I, I am an Eagles uh, football fan, but I, I think that, that uh, what I would say is that, 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 that when the committee was formed, that Harvard committee, and finally defined brain death, I mean, that really opened up the field of heart transplantation, because otherwise, before that, you had to wait until the heart stopped beating, which, you know, was yeah. um, made for a much longer wait. So, yeah, so there is the concept of brain death, or at least a legal concept of brain death. And of course, with the first heart transplants, there was always the question of if they... If you get a new heart from a person, do you somehow become that person? Mm -hmm. What actually is being, you know, uh, transferred? And uh, you know, uh, they thought that perhaps personality was also being transferred with the heart. Also, remember the, the heart transplants. Some of the heart transplants were, you know, were chimp hearts or baboon hearts. And then the question became, you know, would you take on the characteristics of that animal? You know, if you got a stag's heart, would you become brave? If you got, you know, a heart from the Eagles football player, would you not be able to play defense? Those sorts of things. Well, interestingly enough, just a couple of days ago, we had a transplant of a pig kidney into a human. That's right. That's right. Right. Wow. And it seems to be uh, functioning pretty well. Yeah, because you can now gen you know, genetically engineer pigs so that you that, that tissue will be less rejectable. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Paul. Has VAERS detected legitimate issues with vaccines? Yes, I think that that in the late 1990s there was an increased incidence of reports to VAERS about the Rota Shield vaccine, which was a, a Wyeth product associated with NIH, um, as a cause of interception. It was it was it, it was also within the first week of getting the vaccine. It was in children who were two to three months of age, which is young for interception is intestinal blockage um, when your small intestine sort of telescopes into itself. Um, and that then led to, because VAERS can't ever test the hypothesis, that led to testing the hypothesis, looking at children who did or didn't get that vaccine to see whether there was an increased risk. And myocarditis, myocarditis with the mRNA vaccines was originally reported to VAERS, and that led to then the studies proving that it was a rare but real risk. So yeah, I would say those are the two times when VAERS has actually been helpful. For the most part, it's, uh, it's done, I think, arguably more harm than good, just because it's, it's so misused. What is the relative risk of myocarditis in someone who gets COVID as opposed to someone who gets it because of vaccination? Right. So there was a study in, um, there was a report in JAMA Cardiology of, uh, of older adolescents, young adults who were Big Ten athletes. And what they did was they took these people, about 1,600 athletes who had COVID, and they did gadolinium enhanced uh, MRIs, which is say, looking for evidence, any evidence of uh, myocarditis, and found an incidence of 2.5%, so around 1 in 45 or so, which is, you know, certainly much, much, much higher than it's found after vaccine. So there is no um, risk-free choices when it comes to myocarditis. Uh, Carrie, how long can an embalmed body be preserved? Well, that goes back to that question that people want to know what somebody looks like, you know, I can, we can have somebody that we embalm and by the next day they're decomposing so rapidly. It just, about, there's too many factors. There's no timeline that you can put on those things because of all the factors. Somebody can get tissue gas, which is this advanced breakdown of the system, which you just are fighting the whole time and they can blow up twice their size and have blisters all over their bodies 
you know, three hours after embalming. So it just, there's too many factors. There's no real timeline. Have you ever had a situation where someone has to be buried in a special way, a special coffin? The reason I ask is when Marie and Pierre Curie's bodies were transferred in, in Paris to the, the Pantheon relatively recently, they had to be put into lead lined coffins because their bodies were still radioactive. Yeah, have I have I anything? have not encountered that here. I mean, that's such a rare situation. I have not encountered radioactivity. Sometimes people, if they're doing radiation treatment, it can affect where we have to wait until the half-life is over. So the person might have to be stored for a time period before they can be cremated or things can be done, but it's not very common you run into that. Is preparing a body different for a child than an adult? No, that's, they're just smaller. I mean, their circulatory system is just smaller. Truly, you can embalm in the same methods with a baby. You may just use different arteries. Um, sometimes you absorb from the outside in if the child's too small, like a, the baby and infant is too small, but otherwise it's the same. I would think that it would be emotionally more disturbing. It's all about mindset. I think you, you know, you can't think about who or what's in front of you. You think about your task. Otherwise you get caught up in something and you can't do your job. So it's putting your mind in the right place. I would think Paul would think that, you know, the same if you sat and got caught up in the emotion of all oh, this poor child and oh, this poor family and oh, the situation, you, you can't get past that to do your job. So you have to kind of think past it. And then once you're done, you, some of it maybe catches up to you. Paul, well, how do you, how do you handle the personal attacks against you by the uh, anti-vaccine people? Uh, is it affecting your life? Um, I live with a lot of denial. I, I don't, I think that the, the goal of being, and, and actually just in the last 48 hours, I've had probably 1,500 emails from people asking me to vote no tomorrow on the vaccine for five to 11 year olds. It's a planned cyber attack against me and I think other voting members of the committee. And, and you know, I've been threatened, physically threatened. I've had three legitimate death threats, the kind that have to be investigated by the FBI. And my children were threatened once, but I, I, I think they're cowards. I think the goal of, of attacking me is to get me to stop talking, stop standing up for science. And I just don't think they're, I just don't think they're going to hurt me. I don't. I, I, um, I guess if I really thought someone was going to hurt me, maybe I'd stop. Uh, when I when my children were uh, threatened, um, I talked to my wife at length about whether she wanted me to stop. I would have stopped then, but she said, "You know, they're cowards and just stand up." So no, I I, I live with Kyle. Accosted, accosted person to person, like live accosted. I'm sorry, say it again, Joe. Never been accosted, like. No, I have been physically accosted. When when the CDC, when you go to CDC meetings, you know, at the CDC, sometimes there'll be protesters, and when you walk through, they'll you know they'll grab you. For example, that happened once, and then I've had people come and you know, like put things right in my face, like a camera right in my face. They're daring you to just touch them or their camera, because that's you know that's battery. So they they push the limits. I do. Um, I did have one person come up and sort of put a camera in my face and. You can see it because I actually cursed at him. It's uh, popular. It's with, uh, tens of thousands of people see me say, get the fuck out of here. So you can watch that on YouTube. Carrie, I guess you don't have to worry about your customers grabbing you and, and objecting to what you not, do. Not usually, but things people can get pretty fiery when they come in to make arrangements and when you're working with people. And I've, I think through the YouTube, that has opened this kind of platform of people being able to say whatever negative thing they want about a funeral director. So kind of, as Paul was saying, it's, it's cowardly people behind their keyboards that will say whatever they want to say, but if they were probably in front of your face, I would say the majority would never say those things and they would never attack you in those ways. But it's, with our internet nowadays, you can do a lot of things that normally you would never have been able to do 20 years ago and say things. And when you're kind of the front face of maybe an industry or a business like funeral directing, which doesn't always get a great rap, um, you know, I take the brunt of some of what people 
have thrown and some people go a little crazy and sent having to send things like Paul said, I've had to send people emails and things to the FBI just because they get a little kooky and you just have to report them and nothing ever comes of that stuff. But yeah, people get a little. Paul, I get about half a dozen emails every day about ivermectin and uh, many of them are vicious. Uh, uh, I find that the ivermectin people actually are more vicious than the hydroxychloroquine people were. <laughs> and one should do a study on that. And uh, yeah, I, I've gotten threats because of what I've said uh, that it just doesn't work. So what do you, what's your opinion now on ivermectin? I think people should ask their large animal veterinarian whether ivermectin is right for them. No, I'm just kidding, that was a joke. Um, yeah, no, I, I think well, it, I think it could be better studied. I mean, I don't think there's any good evidence that it works. It is amazing to me, though, how people are perfectly willing to take ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine and then don't want vaccines. I mean, you know, the, then uh, people have died from hydroxychloroquine because it's associated with, you know, cardiac abnormalities, arrhythmias. And they're perfectly willing to do that, but they don't want to get the vaccine. It's just I, I just I don't understand the mindset at all. Hey, Paul, should vaccine strategies or schedules be changed in people who had COVID infections? Oh, I see. Um, well, natural infection does protect. Uh, there, there are now five studies showing that if you get a single dose of an mRNA vaccine following natural infection, that acts as a second dose. I, I really wish the CDC would step forward with that recommendation to make it clear. But what happens there, it's more bureaucratic than anything else. If you only get one vaccine and then you're working in an area that's requiring you know, you to be vaccinated, and you've just gotten one dose, you know, that's not completing, say, the two dose mRNA series. So I see that problem. But so one dose of an mRNA vaccine really is enough after you've been naturally infected. And you could argue if you didn't want to get vaccinated after you've been naturally infected, you could say, look, I'm protected against serious illness. Here's all these data that I'm protected against serious illness. I realize I'm not going to be protected as well against mild or asymptomatic disease if I got a boost. Um, but, you know, I can handle that, which is fine up to the point of, say, if you work in a hospital or you work in a um, long-term care facility where asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic shedding is an issue, um, it, it's, it's hard. I think we're learning as we go here. The best situation, by the way, is to be uh, vaccinated and then have a, a sort of low natural infection, like mildly symptomatic. That gives you your broadest immunity. Those are the winners. You know, we have the vaccine passport in effect here. Uh, so if you go to a movie, restaurant, hockey game, you need to show it. Uh, do you think this is ever going to happen in the U.S.? No, no we're, 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 we're pathetic. I mean, I think the war against COVID in our country has become a war against ourselves. I mean, there's a solid 65 million people who just don't will not get vaccinated. I mean, they're willing to lose their jobs. Look at Kyrie Irving, who's the poster boy for the unvaccinated, you know, plays for the Brooklyn Nets. He refused to be vaccinated. He will lose $17 million at least this year for not being vaccinated. I mean, he's not being asked to get a heart transplant. He's just being asked to get a vaccine. It is remarkable to me how dug in people are on this. How do you think it happens? I mean, like Kyrie Irving, uh, in, obviously he's not a highly educated guy. He, although he got through college somehow, maybe majoring in basket weaving or whatever. But what do you what I mean, what do you think the logic is just the freedom of, of choice? I think some people are legitimately scared. I mean, you're, you're asking them to inoculate themselves or their children with a biological agent they don't understand. And they, they fear the disease. It's not like they don't, they don't I think they do fear the disease, although there have been studies showing that if you rate a disease as being particularly dangerous, like or you perceive it as being particularly dangerous, like anthrax or Ebola, you will perceive that vaccine as also being particularly dangerous. So I think that's part of it is, is actually fear of getting the vaccine. They really, and then the other part, and I think it's probably the bigger part, is just don't tell me what to do. Government off my back. I'm, I'm standing up for my rights as an American citizen to infect everybody else around me and kill them. There's a study that I would like to see, very similar to one that was just done about MSG, monosodium glutamate, the flavor uh, enhancer, where they surveyed over 800 people and they gave them tests, a scientific test to, you know, to diagnose their knowledge about the, the subject. And the people were then divided as being anti-MSG or don't care, it, it, it's okay. And the interesting thing was that the people who were anti-MSG rated themselves as being much more knowledgeable than they really turned out to be. 
So on the scientific questions, they did very poorly, but they rated themselves as being very knowledgeable. Whereas the people who said, well, I don't care much about MSG, they did very well on the scientific quiz and didn't rate themselves as being as expert as the others. So it would be very interesting to see this with vaccination to, to select a relatively large number of people, give them a quiz on the basic science on vaccines, and then ask them how confident they are about their answers. And I bet we would see the same kind of result is that the people who are anti-vaccine would show, would be much more confident in their wrong answers than the, uh, than the other group. It would be a very interesting thing to do. I'm sure you're right. Uh, Carrie, how did you decide to be a mortician? I started working on a funeral home in high school and just being around it, I think sparked curiosity. And so through the course of going to school and starting college, I went to college wanting to be an epidemiologist and then realized how much statistics was involved in it. And that went out the window. So I uh, ended up in psychology and then got my psych degree and then went to mortuary school because I remained interested in it. And so just kind of fell along the way. Just oh, very second you, nature. How did you decide to, to become a pediatrician as opposed to some other specialty? Um, I, I, I guess the um, just sort of the scars of your childhood. When I was um, five, I was in a polio ward for about six weeks. And I think I saw those children as kind of vulnerable, you know, alone. And, um, and, and so I think, as always, at some level in our adult lives, we treat ourselves. So I think that's probably why I chose pediatrics. Vulnerable, helpless, alone. Carrie, do you ever need to change your mortuary practices to accommodate certain religious practices? Um, not so much change, but sometimes there's urgency to the timeline. Um, if you get somebody who's, let's say, Muslim, we have a very strict timeline that they want to be buried by sundown. So it kind of stopped the press and having to get the cemetery involved and everybody involved and get things set up so that you can facilitate the religious needs of the people that you're serving. So sometimes that definitely stops the tracks of everything else you're doing to be able to serve the families. All right. Well, I mean, there's lots of questions, but we've yeah. got to put a stop to it sometime. So Paul, thanks very much for uh, joining us. Thank you. Taking, taking time off from CNN to <laughs> take time for us. But you see on, on CNN, they only get a couple of minutes of you. Here, we got the full dose. And uh, Carrie, thanks very much for giving yeah. us information that otherwise we would never, never hear about. Uh, it's just a, a fascinating world that you live in. So Thanks. we've learned how to live with COVID. And we've also learned what happens when you don't live with it. And uh, of course, we'll be back uh, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Leslie Fellows will join us. She's a McGill neurologist. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the brain and how we can extend its longevity. And I am going to explore spiritualism and whether or not it is possible to speak with the dead. So we're going to have an interesting evening tomorrow. Again, same time, same station, as they say, 7 p.m. Thanks again, Paul. Thanks again, Carrie. And thanks to all of you for watching. And hopefully you can join us tomorrow at 7 for yet another interesting Lorne Trottier Public Science Symposium. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.